Describing Mike Lee in this week's New York Magazine, film critic David Denby writes, he digs deeper into people than any other director now working in movies. After the success of last year's Academy Award nominated Secrets and Lies, Lee is back with Career Girls. The film is about two women who were very close friends in college but have not seen each other in six years, and it bounces both between the present and the past. Here is a clip. Wait for it. Must come. Well. Joining me now, director Mike Lee, and I am very pleased to have him back. Welcome back. Well, thank you. Hi. <laughs> yes. I nearly said welcome. Yes. Uh, What's the story behind this? I mean, I'm interested in, in finding out this story, Career Girls, but also how it fits into the continuum of what you choose to do. Well, there are various things. I mean, uh, my films tend to co co constantly go back to ongoing preoccupations. <clears throat> now, this film... Like what? Well, for example, I mean, I'm always fascinated by time going by, friendships, uh, the way people change, and whilst, at the se whilst changing at the same time, you stay the same. This is a film about people that hook up, not having seen each other for a while, and we flash back and see them when they were, like, 10 years younger and 20-ish sort of as well. When you hook up with old friends, you know, you sort of... It's fascinating how people see... You think, God, he's aged. God, look, at, look at him, he's really changed. And after a while, it's that same youthful person in there, you know. It, I mean, I dealt with it in Secrets and Lies in a different way. I mean, in Secrets and Lies, there was a huge amount of stuff going on about the past yeah. and the way the, pa the present, the past was catching up with the present and stuff. So it's, a, it's that sort of preoccupation with the passing of time and the way life continues and, you know, we have to cope or not cope, the way people fail to cope with all of that. I do this thing which which we've talked about before, uh, where we develop the whole the characters and the relationships and things in long rehearsal periods, sure, and right. we that the, the actors live. I have the actors live through the years and years of the characters' lives in order that when you arrive at the final time present of the movie, um, it's all there, all the layers and resonances are there, so that the characters really are feel like real people. So what always happens is that I sit there in my capacity as the guy chairing it and looking for the story and directing the operation. And I see the development of these characters over these years and years, but finally I drop anchor and I say, OK, this is time present and this is the story, and then we tell the story, and often the past is only referred to, as it was, for example, in Secrets and Lies. They talk about the past. And what I thought, I mean, having done that any number of times, it suddenly occurred to me one day that I thought, well, why don't we make a film where we actually go back and uh, I let the audience see those developing uh, years. And so in this film, in Career Girls, um, it starts at time present and it flashes back constantly to different stages of their relationship and of their development so that you actually see what they were like. And by a, building a kind of um, kaleidoscope, of the past and the present, the whole thing, I hope, is a kind of forward-moving picture of how, what they're about in a kind of total way. Are these two people that are satisfied with their lives? No. I call it career girls because, you know, that's what they're being, you know, career girls. They've got careers, they've got jobs, they've got, you know, um, they seem to be doing all right. But they are, it's not happening quite as they want it. It's not, you know, they haven't got what they want. They're, they're not fulfilled. They haven't got the relationships they want and so forth. Um, and it's a debate. I mean, I do, as you know, make films that are kind of open, open-ended in many ways. I mean, it's, were they happier when they were students or are they happier now? They were happier when they were students. Well, maybe, but they were still having a bad time with the students yeah, as right. well. They were You know, there was joy. And I mean, we've just seen a clip where, you know, it's, where they're sort of enjoying themselves, but they're sort of under, there's a kind of sardonic side to that game they're playing there. Life is uh, not straightforward. And do they feel bounded by their circumstances, unable to break out? Um, present time. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, they're, they're, they're sort of locked. I mean, both of them. One, do they feel doomed? I don't think they feel doomed. No, they don't. In fact, they're, they're kind of, they still talk about hope and wishing and longing and 
you know, look, they look on the brand. It could all side. still turn out okay. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. But they, you know, I mean, both of them, each of them uh, in their adult career girl mode, uh, now in the 90s, each of them was in some way tied to her mother. One's got an alcoholic mother that she has to look after, and the other one has gone back to live with her mother, who she really gets, her problem is she really gets on with her mother, who mm -hmm. was long since abandoned by her father, and so she feels she's really going to make the break again. And, mm -hmm. How did the two actresses inform the character? Catherine Cartledge, who plays Hannah, one of the two, who was in uh, Naked, um, Breaking the Waves, and various other films, who is a brilliant, um, serious, comic, um, emotional uh, character actress. They both are, actually. Um, brings to it this incredible humour. Hannah is a... Is a a character with a great sense of humour, a sardonic sense of humour, a self-mocking sense of humour, um, a sarcastic sense of humour, but a sense of humour nonetheless. And when she's sort of young, when she's, when she's in her kind of um, 20, 21 uh, period, she's constantly going into all these different characters and doing different voices, all kinds of things. And, uh, I mean, you need to have an actress who can do all that. Uh, and Catherine is one of those. Linda Stedman, who I've not worked with before, who is a brilliant, emotional, sort of, you know, feeling kind of actress, really brought to it great, great um, compassion. And the, and the great thing is they click together, which of course is always the, the you thing. You can never predict that. You can't. You can second guess it. But, I mean, you know, it's the same as Brenda Blethyn and Marianne Jean-Baptiste, yeah. uh, with whom I was here last night. Secrets and Lies. Yeah, yeah, Secrets and Lies. I mean, uh, when it clicks, it's great, but I just hope it will. Roll tape. Here is another scene in which Hannah and Annie are reacquainting themselves with each other after not having seen each other, as we said, in six years, and talk about each other's traits and what they like about one another. You see, I envy your ability to stand on your own two feet. Yeah, but that's just self-protection, isn't it? And the way you deal with men. That's all I ever do is deal with them. Okay. You and I were just talking about the fact that women have these kind of conversations, and then no. On and you the said whole, to me, yeah. you should. I, no, well, you said, I you, said you, I don't. You, you said I don't, and I, I'm suggesting that you, you should. Said that I, did. <laughs> I did. I did. Well, you talk to your girlfriend about things like this, yeah. you know, but you don't. I mean, at most time, I'm with guys that we're talking about sports or politics yeah. or things beyond ourselves, for the most part, 90% yeah. of the time. Yeah, it's about right. something else. Yeah. It's not about ourselves, yeah. other than if, if you're working on a project. That's right. And you, sir? I, on the whole, I mean, there are relationships I've had with guys, but I'm incidentally an entirely heterosexual person, yes, I hasten to say. Um, uh, there are some, some old friends that I really can, two or three, that we really can sit and chew the fat at this level. But yeah. on the whole, you're right. And I mean, I've got at least one very close friend where we never actually address things that we should, you yeah. know. It's true. Because it removes barriers between people. Not yeah. so much barriers, but it removes... It, no, it enhances who we are. I think that's it's right. more about enhancing right. than it is removing yeah. something. Uh, was it... It would be easier to do a show, a movie like this, about two women than two men coming together, I guess. Uh, I guess you're right. Um, and or you just like working with actresses more. No, I don't particularly. I like working with actresses. Um, but I think that's a good challenge. Or I think it's about time I did one about blokes. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to come to this later, but what are you, what are you on to next? I don't, I don't really like talking about what I do until I've done it. But just... Oh, just give me a taste. I will. I'll give you one thing. I'll tell you one single thing. Um, the film that I'm preparing at the moment, which yeah. is going to take rather longer to come back with than this last one did, will be set in the 1880s. And that's all I'm going to tell you. Leading into the turn of the century. I'm saying that's no all more. you're going to tell me. That's right. That's enough. <laughs> are, are you working on the script now? Is that what you are? Well, I'm working on preparing the film, certainly. Yeah. Um, someone once said that you, in your casting, are like a painter choosing a paintbrush. Fair dues. Do you think that's... that's it's sort of right, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, it, you. I mean, I. I'm only as good as my actors. 
and the painter's only as good as his brush. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> You're only as good as your actors, yeah. but are your actors only as good as you are as a director? Absolutely. Really? I would say so. I mean, that isn't to say that they don't... Two do... good actors, two good actors with a good script yeah. don't need a director. That's true, but as you know with my stuff, there ain't no script. <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> and that the, the so-called script, which isn't really a script, yeah. it's the decision as to what happens, comes out of the work that they do. Now, you know, and you could... You, you actually... It, but it's pretty much after the period of the rehearsal and yeah. getting to know each other and adding to it and living the character. Yes. and in, a lot of improvising. But By that time, how, there is a script. Yes, but that's very much something that... Ha they create. But that happens... It's a two-way thing. I mean, I couldn't do it without them, and they couldn't do it without me, I don't think. You mentioned Terence Rafferty. This film has gotten good reviews. Terence Rafferty in The New Yorker, not as good, not so good, said that the film's message is whether you mean it or not is don't look back. Is that the film's message? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it is, actually. I don't, I don't think... I think that uh, looking back is a good thing to do. And in fact, I think they gain quite a lot from looking back in the film. What do they gain? Well, they... It makes them re-evaluate uh, each other and themselves and start to appreciate some positive things in, their, in themselves and their relationship. Yeah. So I think he's off, way off the mark. It amazes me how people can, in a sense, form impressions of how things are, which it seems to me frequently uh, could do with a little correction, a little packing to the left or right in order to fully appreciate their worth and their possibilities. I think that's right. Absolutely. And it's, I think it's right, I think you're, you're on the case, because that is sort of what this film's about, I think. I would say so. Otherwise, they'd be terribly depressed. Well, yes, it would be a sort of instantly terminal existence. <laughs> <laughs> you have no... Do you have a large ambition? Well, it's a, <laughs> I mean, you're asking this question of a 54-year-old person. What's wrong with that? I mean, no, why I'm not, let me finish that? what I'm saying. I, that's <laughs> not a criticism. It really is. Well, I'm not worried about criticism. No, but it's, however, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm merely saying that you're asking the question of a middle-aged person who's been um, making movies for a, really a very long time. Right. Like, my first film was made in 1971, and I have been doing theatre before that. Um, so... It may be that the large ambition that you imply has kind of, in some way, have been fulfilled in the sense that, you know, I always wanted to make movies and get somewhere with it, and that seems to be what's happened. And that's a large ambition, and it has been fulfilled. Yes, absolutely. I, I now, I mean, I feel that the job is to go on making movies and get on with it, really. And you see, you're very different. Let me just say this. You didn't know you were coming for a cast for a no, for a session. therapy session, did no, you? No, I didn't. But it's great fun, <laughs> and, and the tea is very good. <laughs> I th Woody Allen is in pursuit of making. He once said to me, "A great movie," and does not think he's made ah, a great movie. Now that's a different thing, right? Now yeah. that 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 I am with him all the way. Whatever you do, I certainly feel this. I, you know. You never feel you've made the great movie yet, right. and I, I, that's for sure, you know. Um, so, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that I feel that, uh, that I've absolutely cracked it and that, that there's no more to, no. There's nowhere further to go. Certainly, um, there's always a feeling that there's the definitive film to make, which has not yet happened. So if that is the ambition, then certainly it stands. Then name me one director that you know who made a definitive film. According to me or according to him? Well, according to you first. Well, um... Would... Renoir? Oh, well, that's a long time ago. A director, I mean... Okay, but tell me some contemporary director. Who's made a definitive yeah. film. Yeah, and would David Lean have considered any of his films a definitive film? No idea. Okay. I, I mean, if he considered um, Lawrence of Arabia his definitive film, then according to certain criteria, fair enough. Yeah, and he may have wanted to be defined as a great epic filmmaker. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, passage to, if he thought a, a Passage to India was a definitive film, then he was fooling himself, because it was a dreadful film, really, yeah. and a travesty of the book. I don't know. He was an old man by then. I don't yeah. know. I All think. right. Who else? 
Dunno. Certainly it's a difficult not one. Wells, who never thought he'd made a definitive film. No, and the odds, the terrible, this is the other grisly, uh, frightening possibility. The, the notion that maybe his best film was maybe Citizen Kane. Yes. I mean, I was talking to somebody earlier today <laughs> about terrible. Kubrick. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Paths Park of Glory. Orange, maybe. Path, no, Paths no, of Glory. Paths of Glory, which was one of his earliest films, not his, actual, not his first film, but it was a very early film, was never, was such a, was a definitive film. I mean, it's an amazing film. And I, I'm very uncomfortable with the notion that, you know, uh, that anybody's early or first film was their best. I mean, it makes me feel very uneasy. You know, it's a little bit like the stories they tell about the RAF pilots in World War II. Nothing they would ever do again would be as exciting and thrilling and consequential Absolutely. as what they did when they were in their 20s. Horrible thought. However, I mean, having, I mean, I know you don't like Naked, for example, but Naked... Is a f I felt when we did that film, and indeed Secrets and Lies as well. I am I in a distinct minority about that. Well, and I adore your work. Okay, but th certainly they were; th those are pieces of work that I kind of felt we'd move. F I'd move forward, and we'd sort of everybody had pulled out the stops, and there were, you know. And it could be that I'm not that interested in the, for the lack of a better word, underlife of London. Could be. You know, <laughs> if it is, then you're not going to enjoy it, Naked. Fair do. Fair enough? Yes. You've loved movies all your life. Yep. Yes. Why? What was it about movies? Well, I mean, this is a, really a question with no answer because, you know, if you're my, perhaps, our age, <laughs> you were. No, I'm a year older than you. You are. So, I mean, we, we grew up at a time when. You could see movies. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, we grew up with the movies. I mean, in the 40s and particularly the 50s, when I was, you know, when we were teenagers, you know. Yeah. In got, the 50s. The movies were there, you know. I mean, yeah. I, I, where I grew up in, in the north of England, Manchester, you could see movies, if they'd let you, or if you could afford it or whatever, you could see movies at, f I th there were um, 14 local flea pit cinemas without even going into the centre of town. Where in the district where I lived, walking distance, um, where they all showed two two films to a, a program, and they changed the program on Wednesdays and had a different program on Sundays. So every Hollywood and British yeah. film that yeah. was made was there to be seen. So in a way, it's part of it's in our bloodstream, really. If I wanted to know about you, and could only know about you through watching your movies, what do you think I'd find out? Well, I think you've got to watch all the movies. Well, so I might watch them all. Yeah. I'd find out what? That you are enormously interested in, as you said at the beginning, relationships, history, memory. People, um, I suppose... Not heroes? No. I think that's right. I think it's the kind of, I mean, what I find, what it, to me is that it's the stuff of life, the raw, um, vulnerable, untidy, um, what we call warts and all drips at the end of your nose, you know, did you wipe your bum this morning, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's, 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 you know, um, I made a film, this, my first film, Bleak Moments, has a kissing, a love scene, so-called, um, where they kiss... It's a long, slow, fumbling, self-conscious, you know, untidy piece of unsuccessful lovemaking. On the whole, what we tend to see in movies when it comes to lovemaking is idealised and certainly the kind of lovemaking and sex that happens to all sorts of people in the world, but there's a whole other area of experience which, for all kinds of social, psychological, emotional, um, and, and other reasons, he's not straightforward. He's kind of inhibited or, um, you know, preoccupied with other things and, you know. Um, preoccupied with other things? Yes, or... other, other worries and tensions and, yeah. you know. And so, I just don't think it's slick. I think, you know, I mean, I, if I was making a movie about love, I, I would want to have a love scene in it, but it would, it would be about two people who sort of come together and, and, it, and sort of fall into 
the sort of not one seducing the other, but fall into the process of sort of connecting, you know, and end up to the surprise of both in some ecstasy. To go back to your question, I mean, I, I mean, I, you'd also see, I mean, uh, there's a lot of eating goes on in my films. I know. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of eating goes on in life, you know. I mean, it's interesting to do. It I is, guess. but it is. It, I just naturally do. I don't think, oh, I'll do eating again. You just suddenly think, oh God, they're eating again. You know, they're, 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 they're people in houses and people yeah. work. There's a lot of working scenes because there's a lot of, or unemployed scenes, you know. And uh, it, it's kind of. But is that a class thing about you? Not especially. I don't think so. I don't think it is actually. I think it's to do with just looking at. I mean, everybody eats and you know, does fulfills all those functions. I, I, I'm interested in what, I am genuinely interested in, you know, what did the, your character have for breakfast? You know, what, what happened? Even people, I mean, I, we're, we're, you were talking to each other and you're right. asking me the, the, the name of this game is that you're interviewing me. But what I'm interested in about you is, you know, what you're actually about and where you live and what you did last night. That's why I do this. All that stuff. That's, that's why I do that. Yeah, that's why you do it. And, you know, uh, that, is, that is the thing that motivates me. And so that whatever character... Why did you do what you did? And what was it about this day and yesterday and yesterday and yesterday? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And why I mean, not? when I was 12, on a very cold, on a snowy day in December, um, I stood in a small house in the hall with a lot of people and my grandfather's coffin was... Uh, brought downstairs by these four old guys, these old yeah. poor bearers, one of whom distinctly had a huge uh, lump of long hanging snot hanging off the end of his nose. And mm. I remember at the age of 12 thinking, this would be, you could film this. And that was a, an absolute moment when I definitely thought I wanted to be a filmmaker in a kind of elementary yeah, yeah. I, 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 See, I'm not even a filmmaker, but like movies, I tell you almost once a day, I think of something that would say that would be some experience, yeah. a great scene yeah. in a movie. Yeah, that's the joy. Of, but you see, in a way, the joy of the joy of cinema is that it's that this is the medium that you can take out, and you know, of course, everyone they were doing it long before cinema was invented. They painted, or they drew cartoons, or they wrote novels about it, or they sang songs they about painted it. Painted pictures on caves. Yes, but they did all of that. But the great thing about the movies is you really can create this wonderful almost three-dimensional world and be out there and make it live. It's fantastic. I, I adore it, I must say. And we're glad you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Career Girls, the Mike Lee film, getting good reviews at your local theater. We'll be right back. Stay with us.